I'm a little sad that this is my last session with you guys. Now, I know you're probably really looking forward to getting into your own bed, um, but I just feel like we're just getting in the groove here and I wish we had a wee bit longer, so I'm a little sad that this is our last time. We have been looking at wisdom this weekend, and there's a longevity that we need to speak about when we're exploring wisdom and being people of wisdom. We need wisdom for now, but we also need wisdom for our tomorrows as well. Um, over this weekend, we have we started off with, where does it begin? Uh, wisdom begins with God. We looked at the now, that was last night, and thinking that wisdom asks for courage and compassion. But we also need wisdom for tom our tomorrows. I have no idea what is coming down the line for any of us. I have no idea what you will face tomorrow, next year, five years time. I know that there will be unexpected days. There will be times of immense happiness. There will be desperate sadness and grief. There will be pain. There will be hard things. So wisdom will require tenacity. There's a cracker wee verse tucked in the very end of Jude. Jude's that really tiny book, almost at the very end of the Bible. And at the very end it says, To him who will keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. <coughs> to him, that who we've been looking at, seeking, uh, looking after this weekend, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and great joy. That is what we need. We need to realise that he is enough. And whatever thing might fall in our eyes, it, um, we won't stumble because his grace, his love, his compassion is enough. He holds you. He will guide you tomorrow. So we need to be people who are developing tenacity. Now, tenacity um, is a word that means the quality of being determined um, or, pers or persistent. It's a bit of a Northern Ireland phrase a wee bit, I think because we are tenacious people. We have the ability to get up when we fall down, to not let things keep us down, to keep on keeping on. And when you see tenacity in the Bible, you won't see the word tenacity, but you'll see other words like it, like perseverance and character. Words like maturity, patience, holding on. In James, it says, and the thing I love about when we come here together, we're all using different versions of the Bible. So in James, it says, um, let me read a couple of other versions as well as the one that's on the screen. Let perseverance finish its work in you so that you may be mature and complete, <coughs> not lacking in anything. Let perseverance finish its work in you. Or um, uh, if you let that patience work in you, the end result will be good. You will be mature and complete. You will be all that God wants from you. Wisdom requires tenacity. It requires perseverance, character, maturity. There'll be times in your life when your friends say, God, Jesus isn't real. When good friends stop going to church, when you yourself are riddled with doubts that paralyze you, there'll be times when circumstances will always get the better of you. You will need tenacity. You will need to seek your goal, your king for wisdom, because the goal here is the forever. You, me, we have been called to the forever. A life, a glorious life with him forever. Wisdom requires tenacity. Wisdom will give you tenacity. I love that it's almost like you've got this inbuilt resilience and that will enable you to face whatever life throws at you, to keep on keeping on to walk tall. Because remember, you are sons and daughters of the Most High. Walk tall. Walk tall. You are sons and daughters of the Most High. So you want to see this wisdom personified. That's what I want to do this morning. We've spent a lot of time in the Old Testament. This morning I'm going to get us to dive into the New Testament. And so turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. In this one instant, we see an amazing display of tenacity that is inspiring. Throughout it all, Jesus holds on to who God is, and he holds on to this wisdom. We pick, pick up the story um, uh, in the life of Jesus shortly after his really public baptism. And then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. Um, it was a temptation that was seeking to rock the very core of Jesus. 
a temptation seeking Jesus alone, on his own, just him. It was personal. It was a temptation seeking to knock Jesus off course. And how did the attack come? A series of questions. In this situation, the questions came thick and fast. Big questions, big questions. How did Jesus respond? So let's look at Matthew chapter four. Um, and we'll pick up the reading at verse, verse four. Then Jesus was led, uh, sorry, <coughs> verse one. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting forty days and forty nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, "If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread." Jesus answered, "It is written, man shall not live on bread alone." but in every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. This was close up and personal, wasn't it? It was close up and personal to Jesus. And the questions were coming thick and fast. If, if you are. These are questions not being flung at anyone else at this moment in time. They were being flung at Jesus. They were questioning his identity, his ability, questioning his status. If you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down. If you will bow down and worship me. But they're also questioning his leadership, questioning the kind of leader he was and he would become. How would he use his power? Would he benefit from this position? What was important? <coughs> if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down. If you bow down and worship me. Three times we hear the devil was chuckling at Jesus. If you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, if you bow down and worship. The first two were pushing against his identity, his belonging, his calling, and the last if was trying to <coughs> offer him an alternative God. If you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down. If you will bow down and worship me. Let's go back over and look at these one by one. So the tempter came to him, and it says, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Remember, this is just at a time when Jesus had been fasting. I'm guessing he might have been quite hungry. And he says, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answers, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes out from the mouth of God. Jesus wasn't being cute. He wasn't being a smart aleck. He was saying, I don't need to turn these stones into bread because all I need is found in God. I don't need to turn these stones into bread because all I need is found in God. It's not a glib statement. It's not a glib patronizing statement about poverty. He's just calling us back to the core, calling us back to this wonderful truth. God is enough. He is enough enough. He <coughs> is enough. Then the devil took him to holy city and had him stand on the highest point in the temple. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written. He's not shaking, is he? Okay, let's see. Let's see you work. Um, he's asking, let me see your glory. Let me see your power. And Jesus answered, do not put the Lord your God to the test. You know, we get this request every day. You get this request every day. Friends around you or family around you will expect you to be Superman or Superwoman. 
They will expect you to be better. They will expect you to get it right. But that's not what it's about. There is no Christian superpower. You don't get it right all the time. You don't have endless energy all the time. Um, we can't buy into that. And yet we want to be like, don't we? We like it when people think we're great. But the truth is, we are desperately ordinary. And being ordinary is actually fabulous. We are no different than anyone else. We have good days, we have bad days. We have things that we are really gifted in and things that we are really rubbish at. We are simply ordinary, fabulous people. And so Jesus says, don't put the Lord to the test. Don't accept some get out of jail free card. This is not how we respond to the generosity of God. Are you seeing the wisdom here? Are you hearing the wisdom here? Are you seeing the tenacity here? Are you hearing the tenacity? Jesus is holding on to God, the reality. He is holding on to God. Being a Christian is not a get out of jail free card. Being a Christian is not the promise that life will be without problems. So we need tenacity. We need wisdom. We need to remember that he is enough. There is no point clinging to false promises. God never said life would be easy. He did promise it would be better with him. He never said that you wouldn't face difficulties. He did promise he would be enough. And so again, the devil takes Jesus to a very high point and he shows him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he says, all this I will give you if you bow down and worship me. And this last temptation comes in the form of a second rate promise. And again, we face this every day. They come at it with the status that we live in, the subtle and the not so subtle keeping up with the Joneses, the constant comparing ourselves with other people. They come in a whisper of power or status or greed or fake control because we never really have control. And with this last temptation, Jesus says, enough is enough. Jesus says, away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. There will be times ahead where it will feel easier to give up on God. But remember this, Jesus saying in this temptation, enough is enough. I am not buying into false promises. I am holding on to who God is. What an amazing insight into wisdom, into tenacity. In this one instant, Jesus shows us, points us back to wisdom. The devil was pushing Jesus, and at each turn, Jesus turns back to God, who he is, who God is. Jesus is saying, I am the one who knows God. You say turn stones into bread, I say God is enough. I, am the, I know, Jesus said, I know what I have been called to do and what I haven't. You want me to throw myself down so that the angels will come and rescue me? I am not going down in some flight of fancy. I know what I've been called to do. I am secure in the fact that I am the Son of God. You want me to bow down to you? Why would I bow down to you when I am the Son of the living God? Jesus' response was more than just a clever debate. His response was his life, wasn't it? A life secure a life connected with God, a life lived. Each question, each if, was followed by a wise, deliberate response at each time acknowledging who God is. And, and Jesus lived these answers, didn't he? He knew the importance of God as a source of life. We read about him getting up early in the morning, seeking out time with the Father. He lived this. He didn't use his position for his own good. We'd have him looking out for others, feeding the 5,000, healing, caring, taking time, washing the disciples' feet, sacrificing his life. He knew why he was here, clear, always clear about his call and his remit. There's something about this account of Jesus that illustrates deeply his security in his Father, in himself, in his purpose. Wisdom needs tenacity. It needs perseverance. It needs determination. Be inspired by your Savior, by this image of your Savior. 
by reminding you loud and clear the size of your God. When the ifs get loud, and there'll be times in your life right now or down the road when the ifs will get loud, when we lose sight of who we are and what we're connected to. And so I say, come back to this moment, get out of this passage and see the abundant truth that God ushers you into. You are not called to a second rate life. You're called to the best. You see the deep purpose that he brings, the deep love that he brings, the deep hope that he brings. We need to not just remember who we are in God, we need to remember Jesus himself, <coughs> whose presence changes things, whose power changes things. You know, when we lose sight of these things and the crumbling happens, we allow our natural insecurities start affecting both how we see ourselves and how we see each other. We allow our natural greed to start feeding on our accumulation of stuff, and we forget that we actually started the game on the winning side. We have it all. We allow that need to be busy or productive or have purpose and work, and, and then we start about accumulating tasks rather than the things that we should be doing. <coughs> Questions are part and parcel of life. Some will cause you difficulty, some will cause you a rough night of sleep or two, but you are not alone. You are connected to the one who changes this perspective. He changes the backdrop and therefore he changes the answers. <coughs> Regardless of how you feel this morning or next year, your life is deeply connected to Jesus. You are a child of his. We are people with purpose and love and hope. Hold on to the privilege of that. This is what we get to be part of. Treasure this. Walk tall. Walk tall in the deep truth of who you are and what you have access to. A purpose chosen, a purpose you choose word deep because life will throw so much at you, but know the depth of the new life you have in Jesus. The transforming depth that that life will bring to you. Look up. Look up. Um, just after I finished uni, I got this opportunity to go to Nepal and it was a brilliant time and I was working out there for six months and it was fantastic and as part of it we went um, on, on a trek through part of the Himalayas and it was just a short five day trek and it was, it was amazing, it was absolutely breathtaking at, at, at times to see the mountains up close and to see that. But I remember there was one day where it was just really hard. And um, we were just climbing these stone steps, and it just felt like it would never end. There was no views to be inspired by. It was just like I was just climbing these steps again and again for hours and hours and hours. And you were just watching your feet and watching where you were going all the time. And I just thought, I am finding this incredibly hard. Um, and I remember at that point realizing, this is tough. This is really tough. And I remember stopping and looking up and seeing the view. And for me, it was a real God moment for me because I began to realize that so often in my life, I look down, I look down at what is going on with me and my feet and what's going on in my life or the circumstances around me. And I don't take time to look up. I don't take time to look up and get the view. And so in that moment when I was trekking through the Himalayas and I was watching my feet and I was doing the steps and I was trying to keep going, I, I didn't get inspired by what I was walking to, what I was walking around, what was around me. And, it, and as I retell the story, it's a really profound moment in my life where I realized I need to do that again and again in my walk with God. There'll be time where the circumstances around you are really tough where it'll feel like you are plotting, you are just surviving. And can I invite you in those moments to look up and see Jesus, to be inspired by the life that he is calling you to, that he has gifted you with, that he is inviting you into. This talk this morning is for now, but this talk is one you need to put in your back pocket and you will need to bring out in 12 months time or five years. Life is not easy, will not be easy, but life with Jesus is enough. Persevere, stay determined. God is enough.
want to be people who are wise, it needs to begin with seeking our king. Seek your king. Ask him. Hang out with him. He is utterly generous. <coughs> utterly generous, wanting to bestow on you his character, his heart. Yesterday we looked at the now. What does wisdom look like? Wisdom isn't something to be greedy. Wisdom's not like, so you become really wise and people go, oh, they're really wise. Wisdom is something that you have so you can give away. And again, not in that, let me tell you what I think. Um, but in that way, where well, your heart is burdened for things and you want to be wise. And wisdom is not thinking it all rests on your shoulders. Wisdom is recognizing you're part of a family, part of a church. What can you do together? Wisdom calls for compassion and courage. And this morning we have been looking down the line, thinking what might come our way? And how, when those things come our way, can we remain firm? Tenacious people, be tenacious people, <coughs> perseverant, determined people of character, holding on to the truth that he is enough. He is enough. Wisdom begins with him. Wisdom calls for courage and compassion. Wisdom requires tenacity. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Consider him so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You are not alone. Not only when you go back to your school is it not just you, but you realise there's people all over the schools in, this, in Northern Ireland who are caring about the same things. Be inspired by that. Not only is it that, but there are churches all over this country who are desperate to share who Jesus is. Be inspired by that. Not only that, but you are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses in this time and who have lived and gone. Be inspired by that. Not only that, but you are, look around and see Jesus. Be inspired by him. Be wise. Individually, collectively. Be a generation who are wise. Who carry that wisdom with grace and humility and generosity. Who seek that wisdom because they care about the world around them. Let me finish um, with a letter that you may well have heard of before, uh, written by an African Christian just before he was martyred by his faith. He writes, I am part of the fellowship of the unashamed. The die has been cast. The decision has been made. I have stepped over the line. I won't look back, let up, slow down or back away. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I am finished with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, tamed visions, mundane talking, cheap living and dwarf goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudits or popularity. I don't have to be right or first or tops or recognized or praised or regarded or rewarded. I now live by faith. I lean on his presence. I walk with patience. I live by prayer and I labor with power. My face is set. My gate is fast and my goal is heaven. My road is narrow. My way is rough. My companions <coughs> are few. My guide is reliable. My mission is clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, deterred, lured away, turned back, deluded or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of adversity, negotiate at the table of my enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up. Shut up, let up, until I've stayed up, stored up, prayed up, paid up, spoken for the case of Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I must go till he comes, 
Give till I drop, preach till I know, and work till he stops me. My banner is clear. I am part of the fellowship of the unashamed. Stand and let me pray. God, remind us that we are part of the fellowship of the unashamed. What a delight it is to be your son and daughter. And so God, as we walk out our faith, as we live out our faith, would we know you more in the weeks and months and years ahead? Would you give us wisdom for the everyday things, for the big things and the little things? Would you develop in us that character that is wise, that character that is courageous and compassionate, that character that perseveres, that is tenacious, that will not give up on you because you do not give up on us. When the going gets hard, let us look up and be inspired by Jesus. Let us look up and be inspired by you. Let us look up and realize that the Holy Spirit is present. We are not alone. Remind us that we are part of the fellowship of the unashamed. And the life that you are inviting us into is one of adventure, and we are up for it. Amen.